Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on all of these occasions on our Heritage.org website. would ask everyone in-house to make sure as a courtesy that cell phones have been turned off as we prepare to begin. And, of course, we will post the program within 24 hours on the Heritage homepage for everyone's future reference. And our Internet viewers are always welcome to send questions or comments simply emailing us at speaker at heritage.org. Hosting our discussion today is Hella Dale, who is Senior Fellow for Public Diplomacy in our Douglas and Sarah Allison Center for Foreign Policy Studies. She focuses on U.S. government institutions and programs for strategic outreach to the public of foreign countries, as well as more traditional diplomacy. She also serves as a Media Fellow at the Hoover Institution Stanford on the Board of Visitors of the Institute of Political Journalism and the Center for Free Inquiry at Hanover College in Indiana. Please join me in welcoming Hella Dale. Hella? Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you for coming, and thank you to our author of the day for being here. Um, we are here today to uh, hear about Nick Kravler's new and incredibly timely book, America's Other Army, the U.S. Foreign Service and the 21st and 21st Century Diplomacy. As we have experienced, just about a year ago, the attack in Benghazi um, showed us once again how dangerous diplomacy can be. Uh, we think of diplomats as people who spend their time in the company of the higher circles of society and politics. But really, um, as Nick writes in his book, these people also, in some instances, in some locations, risk their lives just by going to work every day. And that is often not sufficiently recognized. So I am incredibly um, pleased to be able to introduce uh, my friend and former colleague, Nick Kravlev, uh, who is an author and expert on diplomacy, world affairs, and global travel. He hosts a weekly program, which I strongly encourage you to look up online, Conversations with Nick Kravlev, in which he interviews diplomats uh, from the United States and, and other countries about their work. He is a former Financial Times and Washington Times correspondent and has traveled around the world more than Hillary Clinton has. He has flown over 2 million miles and visited 83 countries. He's covered Hillary Clinton, Condoleezza Rice, Colin Powell, and Madeleine Albright. Uh, he is um, the author of America's Other Army, also decoding air travel, and contributes to the Atlantic Foreign Policy Magazine and the Huffington, Huffington Post. And he, in addition to that, also has his own consulting company, Kravlev International. So um, as you can see, we are in the company of somebody who knows whereof he speaks. Nick, please take it away. Well, thank you very much, and thank you all for coming. I wasn't sure how many people show up on, you know, to something that um, doesn't have to do with Syria in a, in a week like this, but uh, I'm glad you all uh, were able to come. So I find that most people think diplomacy is kind of boring as a subject, and um, that's, in fact, why there are not many books about the Foreign Service. I find that my colleagues in the media just don't think that uh, diplomacy makes for good stories and for good journalism. And um, I wanted to prove them wrong. So what happened with me was I, I covered the State Department for about a decade, starting um, with Madeleine Albright, Secretary of State, when I wrote, wrote to the Financial Times. And then Colin Powell came in, and I started traveling more with him. And I was vis uh, as I was visiting these embassies, around the world, I really wondered what it was like to work in those buildings. What, what's it like to be an American diplomat? And this was right before the Iraq war. So the time wasn't very good for US diplomats because they had, well, one of the tasks they had was to sell a war to foreign governments, so to in, gain their support if, if it was possible. So, but in general, I thought after 9-11, new century, What's it like to be an American diplomat? And visiting embassies with the Secretary of State is not the best way to see what exactly they do 
behind those walls and behind those fences. And I thought, I'll have to do more research on this because I really would like to tell the stories of these people and see how effectively they do their job. There was another reason for my interest, not just covering the State Department, but there was a more personal reason for my interest. And the reason was that in 1989, which some of you remember well, and some of you don't, um, but uh, that obviously was the year the, the Berlin Wall came down. And so I was 15, and I was in Bulgaria, where I grew up. And at that time, at that stage, the thing I wanted to be, or I thought I wanted to be, was a theatre director. But as I found out very soon after the changes in November of 89, there was no money for the arts, and all the theatre was in the streets. Because for the first time in their lives, thousands well, in those small countries, hundreds of thousands of people um, were able to express themselves freely after decades of communist rule. And so I was really interested in what was happening and what it meant for all of us and for the entire continent and even the world. So I decided that I was going to be a journalist. And through my first attempts, I became a TV news reporter at 19, and, and at the same time, I, of course, went to college. And so through my studies and through my first contacts with the American embassy in Bulgaria, I began to learn the, the role that American diplomacy had played in ending the Cold War. And I'm not saying that American diplomacy ended the Cold War. I'm just saying that it played the role. And it continued to play the role in the transition to democracy and market economy in Bulgaria and in all the countries in Central and Eastern Europe. <coughs> And so I realized years later after having um, gone to the Kennedy School at Harvard and then covering the Secretary of State in the State Department, I realized that American diplomacy had affected my life. Because if those events hadn't happened in 89, I would not be in this country. I would not have gone to Harvard or worked for these newspapers or traveled with the Secretary of State. So in this case, American diplomacy had a positive impact on me. And I was really interested, was that an exception? Or does American diplomacy affect people's lives in other countries? And is it always positively, or is that not the case? And more broadly, what is American diplomacy about today? We can't just say, oh, we have these embassies for the sake of having embassies, or we want to have relationships for the sake of having relationships. No, I, I want to know how we spend our taxpayers' money and how effective US diplomacy is. And so Benghazi happened. And you've seen these pictures of the four Americans who were killed in Benghazi a year, <laughs> almost a year ago. And what really frustrated me, although it didn't surprise me much, was that with all the media coverage of the cover-up, supposedly, and who did that, and who hit what, and what were the talking points, no one in the media, at least that I saw, asked questions like, what was actually Chris Stevens doing in Libya? What was the mission of this embassy? Why are we in a country like that? How does it help the US national interest by doing this? What's the Foreign Service about? Who are these people? How do we train them? How capable are they to carry out the mission? What is their mission? Right? Nobody, correct me if I'm wrong, but I didn't see one person in the media ask the, those questions, let alone answer them. So um, what I wanted to do with this book was, you know, as I went around the world to do my research, I had three main questions in mind that I just wanted to answer for myself because I was curious what the answers were. And the first one was this one, the one on the screen. Why should we care? Really, how does American diplomacy affect not only people's lives in other countries? Because you can easily make the case, oh, you know, foreign aid, this and that, we help other countries. How does it affect the lives of Americans at home? Not Americans traveling abroad or living abroad, no. How does it affect the lives of Americans at home? Because what Americans most care about is their physical security and their prosperity, right? Well, everything you do in foreign policy, they teach you at the Kennedy School, should be directly linked to the national interest. Otherwise, why are you doing it? So this was the first question. The second was, what is diplomacy in, well, it was 2012 when I finished my research, but what is diplomacy in the 21st century? Is it what they did 20 or 30 years ago. How is it different? Are these people tasked with <coughs> things that were not part of diplomacy before 9-11 or 20 or 30 years ago? Who is in the Foreign Service? Is it still an elitist organization or can anybody join? What are the criteria? 
And the last was, what do American diplomats actually do, specifically? And that was the most difficult question to get answers to. Because, for those of you who know diplomats personally, you know that one of the things they love most of anything else is being general, right? They love generalizations. They like being vague. They don't like being specific, right? And they're not, many of them are not very good at actually explaining or articulating what they do and what the impact is on our lives very well. It's just, and I, I interviewed 600 of them, okay? So it was really like pulling teeth. I mean, I would say, if you were, I'd be in some embassy someplace in the world, and I'd say, if you're back home and you're speaking to a domestic audience, and you ask, what do you do for a living? What would you say? And I was getting answers, you can read more about this in the book, but the, we advance a positive agenda. What? That's your job? I'm sorry. I, if you say this to an 11-year-old and they'll just either laugh at you or just walk away. I mean, seriously, I know what a doctor does. I know what a lawyer does, kind of. I know what a teacher does. But what does a diplomat do? Please give me in a sentence or two what you do. And then we represent the United States. OK, a little more specific. Well, you know, compared to the positive agenda. But what does that mean? If you ask the average person, they'll probably tell you that means going to cocktail parties every day, right? And waving the flag and, well, is that what you do to every day, to seven days, five days a week? So it, it was a challenge, but, um, you know, well, you can judge <laughs> from the book whether I've succeeded. So anyway, I ended up visiting 52 embassies and consulates, some of them more than once, uh, and the, the big and the small and the, the mid-size and the, you know, and the Paris and Bangkok and Baghdad and Islamabad. Um, so I tried to be inclusive. And uh, in addition to the 600 career people in the Foreign Service I interviewed, I also uh, spoke with the last seven secretaries of state from Hillary Clinton back because Kerry wasn't uh, yet secretary of state. So um, one of my big points in the book is the diversity uh, and the variety of things these people are expected to do in the Foreign Service. And um, let me just give you um, examples of four people, four Foreign Service officers, uh, and, and, and show you, tell you some of the things they've done in their careers. I know that many of you actually know a lot about this, but I have a point uh, which hopefully will become clear um, in a few minutes. So the first of these four is Cameron Munter, who some of you may know was the American ambassador to Pakistan. Uh, until about a year ago, for two years. And um, he was the person who, well, he was, first of all, he was one of the few people who watched the, the Bin Laden raid. Um, remember the Situation Room with Hillary Clinton with her hand on her mouth in suspense? So there was a, another feed. So there was a feed in Washington, there was a feed in uh, Afghanistan, there was a feed back into the embassy in Pakistan. And so Cameron was the one uh, watching the events, of course, were happening half an hour away in Abbottabad. And then it fell on him to explain to the Pakistani government why on earth they had no idea that a foreign military operation was taking place on their territory. Which actually wasn't the hard part. It was much more difficult then to try to repair the relationship because the bin Laden raid happened only, uh, let's see, January, so four months after an undercover CIA contractor killed two Pakistani civilians and was actually in jail. And then five months later, we had the NATO <coughs> airstrike that killed 24 Pakistani soldiers. So, I mean, the relationship, as you know, for years has not been good. But how do you do that when you have drones falling off the sky, um, you know, regularly, for, for a good reason, of course. But if you are the, the ambassador, how do you rebuild that trust with the government? Because you don't need it just to be nice to them. You need it because you need them to do things for the, you know, that will help the United States. But anyway, before Pakistan, um, Cameron was ambassador to Serbia. And um, in 2008, you may remember the US, or the Bush administration, recognized Kosovo as an independent state. Well, a few hundred Serbs decided to attack the US embassy. Did anyone ever hear about that attack? Does anyone remember the attack on the US embassy that was set on fire? But anyway, so these was a few, several hundred Serbs. Uh, they uh, actually set, a fire to, set fire to, to part of the embassy. 
thankfully nobody died. Well, actually, one of the servants was drunk, so he apparently jumped one of the, the, the first fence, and he actually burned himself to death. But uh, no Americans uh, were killed. Um, here's the thing. So this happens. Condi Rice is too busy with North Korea and the Middle East. So Cameron decides that he was going to make sure that the prime minister, who Cameron got intel, who had approved the attack. So the prime minister of Serbia, his name was Vojislav Kostunica, he had approved the attack. There was intelligence, evidence that he had. And so Cameron decided that he was going to do everything in his power to make sure the prime minister lost the next election. Is that interfering in another country's domestic affairs? Welcome to the Foreign Service. You, that, you, you're free to think that, but he thought no leader in any country should approve an attack on any embassy, whether it's the, the, US, the American or the Mongolian embassy. And so he did what he, he, you can read the story in the book, but he succeeded, so the prime minister was gone, he hasn't been back since, and I don't think he ever will be. And then before Serbia, Cameron was the leader of what was called a provincial reconstruction team. And the PRT in Iraq, it was actually the first PRT that was formed in Iraq in January of, 20, of 2006. It, he was up in Mosul in the north. And what he and his small, very small team basically did was teach the Iraqis how to govern themselves. As you know, under Saddam Hussein, there was no self-governance. So what does that, what does that mean? So uh, paving roads, building schools and hospitals, um, building infrastructure, setting up a judicial system, which didn't exist. None of these things this guy had ever done in his entire life. He'd been in the Foreign Service 20 years, all of them in Europe, Went back until then, no, no Arabic language skills, never served in the Middle East, no training of any kind to do any of this transformational diplomacy or rebuilding, whatever you call it. He had to learn on his own how to do it. Okay, the, the second of the four is uh, Yuri Kim, who is currently the political counselor, meaning the, the, he's not, she's not a political appointee, she's the head of the political section in Ankara in Turkey. <laughs> And as you can imagine, she spent most of her time in the last two years working on Syria because many, many Syrian refugees are now in Turkey and living in, in refugee camps. Before that, actually at the time Cameron Manta was dealing with the embassy on fire in Belgrade, Yuri was in North Korea, which is unusual, of course, because as you know, there are no American diplomats in North Korea, but she was there accompanying the New York Philharmonic, which had a concert in Pyongyang in 2008. She she'd actually organized the visit. She, at the time, worked for Chris Hill, who was the chief negotiator with the North Koreans. And the concert was a carrot, because, as you know, we have sticks and carrots in diplomacy, right? So the, the concert was a carrot for the North Koreans to do certain things on the, uh, on the nuclear negotiations uh, that were going on uh, at that time. The third of the four is David Lindwall, whom I met in Baghdad um, about a year or so ago. And he, at the time, was the political military counselor at the embassy. <coughs> If almost every embassy has a political military section whose main job is to sell American weapons to the host country. Yes, American diplomats sell American weapons. The Pentagon initiates the deals, but state is in charge of vetting them and approving them. So um, he told me that since the fall of Saddam Hussein, the, the Iraqi government has purchased over $16 billion worth of American weapons and other equipment. Before uh, Iraq, David was the deputy chief of mission in Haiti, and he was the one who managed the search for missing Americans after the earthquake in 2010. He actually, he would have died, his house collapsed. If he'd been home, he would have, he'd be dead today. In fact, the cultural affairs officer died, Victoria DeLong, because she was home at the time. And before that, he was the DCM, the deputy chief of mission in Guatemala. And one of the main things the embassy did at that time, which was the middle of the last decade, was to reform or to help the Guatemalans reform their child adoption system. My, the question I ask most often in all my interviews was why? Why did you do that? What's, what's in it for, for the US interest? And so, you know, Guatemala is not, okay, Central America, but not exactly Mexico down at the border. So why do we care about reforming Guatemala's child adoption system? And it had been very difficult. So much money was spent on this, I mean, the American taxpayers' money, because the embassy had tried for it more than a decade to get the Guatemalans to actually do something, because it was such a corrupt system. You, you may remember about a year ago, 
there were these stories in the media about children who'd been kidnapped from their, they'd been, they, so the, uh, the people who had done the trade had told the, um, the adoptive parents in, in the US that the, these children had, had been put up for adoption or that they, their parents had died. The, the birth parents had been told that the, the children were stillborn or something. And so now, years later, it turns out, these birth parents are coming forward and saying, wait a second, what? And so there was a girl about a, about a, August, about a year ago uh, that was in the media that the birth parents wanted to, to take her back from, their, uh, from her um, US parents. So it was a big deal. But anyway, so the point is they spent, the embassy spent so much money and so much human hours of people, the embassy for over a decade to get the Guatemalans to do something. And the reason was that before the ban on adoptions um, by Americans from Russia, recent, a few months ago, the, if you looked at the list of foreign countries from where you, Americans adopt children, number two, of, num the first two was for China and Russia, number three was Guatemala. And so, as you know, what do Americans do when they get frustrated with something? They like, write their congressman, right? So then Congress was putting pressure on the State Department to actually do something about it. And so that's why they finally succeeded to, you know, in a, in a not, not completely, but still the system now is much better than, than um, it used to be. Um, and in fact, um, this was just a little uh, bracket here. So as big as an effort as that was in Guatemala, it was not nearly as massive and, and amb ambitious as a similar effort in Chile, where the embassy in Santiago in the, the late 90s and 2000 um, helped the Chileans reform their judicial system. And this was huge because you know, all these years after Pinochet had been forced out of power, they still had a very awkward judicial system, meaning that they didn't have trials, jury trials, right? So uh, the, basically one judge had all the power because mm -hmm. the, 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 the mm -hmm. judge was also the prosecutor. I mean, it was really a 19th century system. And so the Chileans decided to adopt what, the, what's closer to the, cur the current German system, but the, so they asked the U.S. for help, and so the, the embassies, I have the, the person who, who managed this is in the book as well. Uh, and so, the, the, again, <laughs> millions of dollars and a lot of American uh, officers, uh, hours, work hours, um, many American experts and uh, lawyers went down to Chile. Apparently, the embassy had to bring down American architects because the Chileans never had courthouses. So... They had to, <laughs> to bring down American architects to teach them how to build courthouses. I mean, you know, do, you, do you think that was diplomacy? I mean, it, you know, all these things that you, you discover. Anyway, the, and the fourth of these um, is Gavin Sunwall, whom I met in Beijing in 2003, 10 years ago. He was the head of what's called American Citizen Services in the consular section. So American Citizen Services is where you go when something happens to you in another country, whether you need to get a new passport, a temporary passport, or you need to register the birth of a child, or you are mugged or something. Um, and he had come into the Foreign Service as a consul officer in uh, 88, and his first tour was in Panama. So within a few days of arriving in Panama, he's sitting in a, ce in a jail cell, right? And he's, a, he's there not because he did anything wrong. He was sent by the embassy. He was sitting across these two serial killers. And they were American citizens. So he was sent, you know, the rookie, the junior officer, so go and visit the, these Americans in jail. And it, th this is normal. This is routine, right? This is the Vienna Convention. So you have to go and uh, pay them a visit and make sure that they're treated humanely by the local authorities. L later, he ended up uh, converting to public diplomacy. So he's now a public diplomacy officer, about to go into language training to go to Copenhagen. <laughs> to be the public affairs officer in Copenhagen. Like, seriously, everybody in Denmark speaks German. Do we need to spend six months training you to learn Danish? Well, we, do we all we... speak English. I'm not sure they all speak German well, anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem with that. Well, the thing, yeah. But given that, <laughs> we send, the given that we send so many people to, to, to Iraq and Pakistan not, not speaking the language, I think we can probably rather focus on that than teach people to, do, to speak Danish, right? Yeah. But anyway, that's that's a different different uh, issue. So, um, Gavin's last tour was a tour was actually in Ka in Kabul. He was the the, um, the spokesman for the embassy in Kabul, and he was there at the time when this, this the the office the soldier who went around and killed sixteen civilians who was just sentenced last week or two weeks ago. Uh, he was there at that time, and then also just uh, I think a few months before that, a few few weeks before that, uh, these other American soldiers were were filmed burning the Quran. And happily doing it in front of the cameras, of course. 
And so then as, as the officer at the embassy, I mean, the, the, the spokesman for the embassy, you can't really explain away things like that, but you know, you have to go out there and say something because everybody expects the US embassy to have a comment on um, when something like this happens. So, um, you know, the, whatever we call it, PR or public diplomacy or public affairs, you have to go and do it. Um, and, and I didn't mention this in any of those because I didn't want to talk for you know, an hour. But um, so another thing that I'm sure you know that embassies and consulates do is um, promote American business, right? Whether they help um, U.S. companies expand their business in a foreign country or um, open up um, a new, new business, they promote, they, they try to help how they do it, you know, obviously Boeing doesn't need much help, but there are many American companies that actually that do need help. So anyway, the point of all this was this list. So and this is a very short list. These are only four people, right? And I don't even say everything they've done in their careers. But I looked at this list and I asked myself, how is this possible? How can teaching effective governance, what, which was what Cameron Munter did in Iraq, nuclear negotiations, cultural events, reforming child adoption systems and judicial systems, selling American weapons, recovering from natural disasters like in Haiti, promoting American business, issuing passports and visas, visiting prisoners in jail, and fixing public relations. But how, how can all this be part of the same profession? We're not saying that each of them is a specialist. No, we're saying that these people are expected to do all of this. And the average officer does at least a third of this of this list, and, and more, because you know, over a 20 or 30 year career, you end up doing seven, eight, 10 tours. And in, in sometimes in, in everyone is in a different country. And so how does this make sense? Do we want American diplomats to be jacks of all trades? How do we just, how do we train, how do we prepare people to be good? Or do we expect them to be equally good at all these things? So, in trying to make sense of all this, and again, you know, what, what is American diplomacy supposed to achieve here? What's, what's the mission? So, I went to the national security strategy, which is this, as you know, every president publishes uh, a strategy at least once. And so, this is the 2010, the, late, the latest version of the strategy, the Obama strategy. And these are the uh, six um, things that the White House, this White House expects of the Foreign Service to help prevent conflict, spur economic growth, strengthen weak and failing states, lift people out of poverty, combat climate change and epidemic disease, and strengthen institutions of democratic governance. I just get tired by saying these words. How do you actually do this? I mean, how much time and money, how many people do you need to do this? And are we trying to change the world? Is this what American diplomats are supposed to do? So, how does that connect back to the national interest, as I mentioned at the beginning? What's the direct linkage? Because to explain this, this to the American people, even to Congress, you, you can't just say, oh, you know, it's good to have relationships with other countries. It's good to engage with other countries. Well, for what? For the sake of engagement? No, it has to benefit the national interest somehow, right? And so, as I mentioned um, earlier, the national interest, you know, on this, there's actually agreement in the two major parties of what is the national interest. In it's the security of the country, the prosperity, and the values we stand for. And um, it's, you know, the values won't change anytime soon. So it's really about security and prosperity if you um, look at it, if you do it, that's what it comes down to. So to make the short, the, 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 the long story short, after 9-11, First, the Bush administration, and then this administration agreed with that decision, basically decided that for the United States to be truly secure, the entire world has to be secure and stable. It wasn't enough for the neighborhood or, the, or the, the hemisphere or the West, no. They decided that a conflict in any country or instability in any country brought about by poor governance is our business because it can destabilize the whole region and then American interests, but ultimately can affect the security of the American people at home. Why? Because if you take a country like Mali, where Amer the French soldiers just left, so 
several months ago, there was this crisis. Al-Qaeda of the Islamic Maghreb was training, or was recruiting and training young men in Mali to join them. Why? Because the government was so weak. There was really no real governance in the country. And so if you have a huge part of the population under 25 years old, and especially for those men, they already have a couple of children each, at least, they need to feed those families. If the government doesn't practice good governance, if the economy isn't functioning, if there are no jobs, these men are going to turn to other means to feed those families, right? And then they might engage in drug trafficking or human trafficking or join Al-Qaeda in a training camp because they'll get 20,000 for the year, and that's huge because it can buy a lot of things in Mali. So, and then what can happen in a year or two? One of, one of those, even one, just one of those men could be put on a plane to Detroit with a bomb in his underwear or shoes. And so that's why, that's the linkage. Nobody in the Foreign Service will explain that, but <laughs> unfortunately. But that's the linkage between good governance in a foreign country and our security. And, you know, obviously it's more than that, but again, I want it to be concise. So the point is the American government decided, and I don't think they told anyone, but they decided after 9-11 that anything in any country is the business of the United States, basically. I'm not questioning that decision. I'm just saying what it is. And they want now a more stable and, and more secure world and more prosperous world because, again, the, in, in economic terms, because of global trade and globalization and easy travel and communication, to be truly to be prosperous, we need, right? We, well, the whole world won't be prosperous anytime soon, but at least we want as many countries as possible to have functioning economies so then the U.S. economy can do well. But this is what now the White House is saying to the Foreign Service. We want you, well, first of all, we are seeking a world that is as stable and prosperous as possible because that's the only way for us in, in the U.S. to be stable and secure and prosperous. And hey, Foreign Service, it's your job to help bring this about. That's what Condi Rice used to call transformational diplomacy. To, you know, not to go and necessarily change another country in the U.S. image, but to get another country to begin practicing good governance. So this is this new diplomacy, the you know, post-9-11 diplomacy thing, the transformational thing, whether you call it that. Some people don't like the term, and I, I know why they don't like it, because they think it's politicized and it's about changing other countries and uh, imposing democracy. But, you know, but it really was about good governance more than uh, anything else. At the same time, the White House, in that same uh, strategy I, I mentioned, says, we know we have the world as it is. We, you know, we, every day we are reminded of the world as it is, right? So, and we need to deal with it. And which is, a, in fact, what, what diplomacy has been doing for a few centuries now. That's, that's what classic diplomacy is all about. So these are the, this is the dual mission of the, of the US Foreign Service now. Not only to deal with the world as it is, but also to help bring about a more secure and prosperous world so the United States can be truly secure and prosperous. And in traditional diplomacy, as you know, we have these four main functions, which are to manage relations with other countries, to represent the US and, and its people, to assist American citizens abroad, and to also what we call do multilateral diplomacy, or address transnational issues, which we do through UN, the UN, NATO, EU, and other organizations. And then transformational, as I said, it's about good governance in as much of the world as possible. And to finish up, so at the beginning I asked, well, how, many, how much money do you need? How many people do you need to do this? Well, here's what we have. So this is the, uh, the 2012 budget. This year they lost a couple of billion, but um, 53 billion was the State Department, so the budget for the State Department and all foreign operations, for all foreign programs, including foreign aid. Foreign aid is 30, was 35 billion out of the 53. Um, I think I think the 2013, because you know there's the continuing resolution, then there was the House version and the Senate version, and there's the other version, and I think we ended up with about 50. So I think they lost 50 or 51, so they lost a couple of billion. In the Foreign Service, we have 13,000 members. 8,000 are Foreign Service officers, or you know, the diplomats, and then 5,000 are what they call specialists. So, um, for example, Sean Smith, who died in Benghazi, he was an information management officer uh, assigned to The Hague, and he was on TDY, in fact, in Benghazi when he died. 
But so these are diplomatic security agents. They're, they're these are specialists, office managers, secretaries. These are so there are doctors in the foreign service. There are nurses in the foreign service. There are um, communications people, um, in technical, and then um, you know you have uh, accountants and all you know other professions. You have lawyers in the foreign service as well. So the total number is thirteen thousand now. For the State Department, you know, we have civil service here in, in, in the country, and then we have the foreign nationals working in embassies around the world. Um, so in total, we have about 70,000 people. So these 13, then we have 10,000 civil servants, then we have political appointees, and we have 44,000 uh, foreign service nationals. How many times do you think the military budget is bigger than the foreign affairs budget? Ballpark. Fair 5, 10, 20, 50? <laughs> Twelve. Okay. So it's con it, it's been consistently over 60, 600 billion. In 2012, it was uh, 640 billion. They lost, I think, a couple of billion also uh, in, in 2013. But this is it. It's about 12 times bigger. And 1.4 million, these are the active duty service members. Doesn't include civil servants or um, reservists. If we were to add those numbers, that will be about 2 million. I'm not saying they should be equal. I'm just, these are the facts. We have this, this much for, for this. And, and so um, this is, um, these are the numbers. Um, I will end with one final thought before we go to your questions. And that is, if we, expect, if we think that what the Foreign Service does or what US diplomacy is supposed to do is so vital for our uh, you know, well-being and our security and our prosperity at home, are we sure that we have the best people to do that? And how do we select them? How do we train them? Do we train them at all? And so one of the, the biggest things I found that surprised me was that, that really there is almost no training. And, you, and I just gave you the example of Cameron Manta who went to Iraq without any training. Well, um, you know, to an, a day and a half of shooting in West Virginia in case, although, you know, diplomats don't carry weapons anyway. but. Um, so that's the big thing, and I have a whole chapter on, on training, or the lack of it, uh, about the Foreign Service Institute. Um, I'm glad that the, the, the new director of the Foreign Service Institute, Nancy McEldowney, who was ambassador and uh, vice president until recently of uh, National Defense University, she's coming on my show uh, in a couple of weeks, and so we'll have a, the whole show to talk about training and what they uh, would do, but really, um, training doesn't exist. They, they expect uh, Foreign Service officers to learn by osmosis on the go, to pick things up from who they, their bosses, uh, to figure it out as they go, um, to self-educate, which is fine, everybody needs to self-educate, but, but come on now. The, you, know, you have people coming into the Foreign Service with no background in foreign affairs at all. Because you know, it's, it's democracy now, Any, anybody, you pass the test, you're in. And we have many people now coming in who's, who, for whom diplomacy is their second or third profession. They're, they're doctors and lawyers and architects and art directors and, and poets and you know, uh, parole officers. Um, and they've never done this before. You cannot expect them to learn from just as they go because it's just too important. Some, of, some diplomacy has to be learned on the job. There's no question about that. But there is a foundation that I believe can be taught. That's why we have a whole institute. And unfortunately, it doesn't seem to. Um, rise to that challenge yet, but you know, oh, they always say, oh, we don't have money, we can't afford, we don't have enough people in the foreign service because if you want to bring someone for training for a year, then you have to find someone else to do that job in, in that embassy, and we don't have that person, so we just, what do we do? We just don't bring anybody to train. Um, so uh, let me end with this, and I'm um, happy to take any questions. <laughs> the force. Um, very, very interesting. I think we'll, um, we're going to go till 1 o'clock, and, and I want to give the audience here a chance to um, ask what questions have come to mind. So I will let you pick yourself uh, among the audience. I would ask, though, that um, you identify yourselves by name and affiliation. We have roaming microphones, and uh, anybody who uh, has a question uh, can raise their hand. Yep, all right, in the back. Thanks very much, Nick. That was a fantastic presentation. I'm Steve Bondi with the Middle East Institute. Um, my question is, there is something referred to... Is that to Wendy's it? thing? It is. Okay. <laughs> Wendy Chamberlain was ambassador to Pakistan, in fact, on 9-11. Yeah. Um, 
there's something in the Foreign Service referred to as clientitis, where you start to sympathize a bit more with the local culture and country than maybe the United States. And I'd be curious if you picked up much of that and uh, how the Foreign Service might take steps to make sure that doesn't happen. So um, I've by now done s over 70 events for this book on this subject. And so I've done this whole spiel, you know, all these times. And I've, I've been around the country and in 10 or 12 other countries. Every time, people are surprised by the fact that American Foreign Service officers have to go to a new country or to, to rotate out of their assignment every two or three years. At most, three. Iraq and Pakistan are one year. Uh, Sudan is one year. Some are two years. Uh, what is two? I think um, some the African countries are two years. But And then three at, at most, right? People don't understand how it's why we change them so often. <coughs> and that, that's, of course, is a lot of resources, right? We, we, to move these families around the world, it's just it's a very expensive thing to do. But that's why they're doing it. So it used to be you could serve for four years. And then someone decided to stay that it's, four years is too much. You, you, many people get to that client title level, a stage. And so they, the transition was, it's three years, but you could extend to a fourth year if you want to. And of course, people were extending in Vienna and Paris and, and Berlin, right? And, but, and they said, no, absolutely not. No extensions at all. And uh, so th there have been occasions now when, I, for example, I met someone at the embassy in Tokyo who was in Tokyo for a couple of years, then went to Afghanistan for it, then came back to Tokyo for another two or two years. So that, but that's different because it's con te technically it's considered two tours in Tokyo with uh, Afghanistan in between. But, um, and that's now. I don't, I haven't seen um, evidence that in recent years um, there have been examples of when clientitis has hurt U.S. interests. It might have happened before my time, I, you know, but, uh, and this is, this is not a historical book, this is a reporting book. This is what the Foreign Service is, what it does today, not what it, what it was 20 or 50 years ago. Um, so that uh, might have been the case back then, and in fact, it probably was because there was, there is, you probably know this, the, the famous um, um, story about George Schultz, right, with the Globe, when some ambassador, American ambassador was in his office, and then he took him to the big Globe and said, okay, show me your country on the, and the ambassador shows him the country he's serving in. And George Schultz says, no, 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 that's not your country. Your country is the, US, the, U, the USA. So, uh, yeah, and every, I mean, many people have given the, this example, but um, so, yeah, I, I currently, I, I'm not um, denying it exists in some person's mind someplace, but I don't think that's a serious problem. Um, there are, I think there are many others. <laughs> yes? Hi, um, hi, Karina Rollins here at the Heritage Foundation. Um, I have a follow-up question to that. Um, my concern about the switching every two or three years was not the cost of moving the families around, but the consideration that public diplomacy is all about people, person to person, people to people contact. Now, that takes time to build. I would think that good relationships with strangers would take at least one or two or three years to build, so it seems like as soon as any relationships are established, the Americans are being ripped out and sent Right. Off again, and that seems very counterproductive. Could you? Well, that's just the beginning of it. Works? I mean, you know, if you look at typically these people rotate out at the same time, right? You have thousands of people changing <laughs> posts at the same time, meaning in the summer, right? Because they have children who need to go to a new school, whatever the reason is. And very often you end up with nobody at that post for a month or more than that. So what I found, which is actually one of the more disturbing things I found in the state, and I've talked to you know, Bill Burns, who is the Deputy Secretary of State, and, and Pat Kennedy, who is the Undersecretary for Management about this, and they don't really see a solution uh, short term in terms of moving people and at the same time in, in the summer. But so another thing I found, and you, you, I was shocked because you know it's 2013 and we have email and, and social media and all this, these instant communication things. So I heard um, complaints that, so, P, so let's say a public diplomacy, a public affairs counselor would go to a new post having never done public diplomacy. You know, let's say he's an economic officer because, you know, they have these five cones or career tracks in the foreign service, political, economic, public diplomacy, management, and consular. 
So very often people would go and do a job out of, outside their, their career track because they're encouraged to do that to get promoted. And so public affairs officer do, doing PD for the first time in his life arrives at a post. His predecessor left six weeks ago and left nothing, okay? So whatever contacts this person had, whatever things he did or, you know, exhibitions he did or she did or cocktail parties she went to or programs she organized, nothing. Not even a list of contacts, right? And Well, it's not because what's the, the, uh, the rationale here is, oh, we have the local employees, right? Whatever the embassy is, you know, oh, we have Thai or Singapore, Singaporean employees at the embassy, so they will, well, that's, it's not the same. Because as you know, in many of those cultures, um, important people in the country don't look upon a, an assistant in the, in the cultural section the same way they, do, they look at the public affairs counselor, who is a senior foreign service officer. So these relationships, you know, they, you know, they are established at the high, at the high level, right? And, and then have to begin from scratch. I mean, it's, this is just an example of, about PD, but this is the same with political c contacts and, and sources, right? So it is a problem, um, and, for, and it's recognized as a problem, but I don't see them doing anything about it, unfortunately. And there is just as I know, all I can do is just talk about it and write about it and push and, and hope that, uh, okay. So let's go here and then here and then here. Oh, and then we are, sorry, I forgot your side. Okay, I owe you. <laughs> We have to, this is, this is, uh, this clock is ahead, so we are, uh, yeah. was it four minutes, four or five minutes? Okay, anyway, yes. <laughs> Paul Deplitsky, president of the American Russian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. First of all, thank you for your fabulous presentation. It's truly eye-opening in many, many angles. Um, one small correction, if I may, respectfully disagree with you that companies like Boeing do not need support. Uh, I think they're among the ones who need most of the support because, say, when they run against the likes of Airbus, uh, when they're bidding for a large contract, you know, diplomacy might be very handy while lobbying <coughs> foreign governments, uh, you know, in these kind of situations. And second, you know, this morning on a Russian website, I read, and I hope this is not true, that allegedly, um, you know, there are no deliberations that um, certain kingdoms might fund American strikes in Syria. I have no idea if it's true or not. I, I hope it's not true. But what would you think? Is it admissible for uh, America to become like mercenaries for some other foreign countries? Um, this is something that to me personally is incom incomprehensible, but I'm not an expert. I would be very much uh, interested in your opinion. Well, so, you know. Um, no, no, I mean, they, they, they said it the other day on the Hill. In the, yeah, the, the Arab states have offered to foot the bill for the, yeah, the, the, the what did he say, tens of, billions, tens of millions of dollars, and he, then Hegel said that their offers from Arab countries. But anyway, um, so one of the things, you know, I'm very fact-based, fact and as a journalist, I try not to take sides or express too much of personal opinions, just be as objective as I can, because I still believe in that old-fashioned concept <laughs> of being objective. Um, so, um, you know, I meant that, you know, the Boeings of the world don't, don't need as much help as, as mid-size and, and small American companies. And in fact, uh, uh, funnily enough, the, um, a friend of mine who used to be uh, ambassador to Indonesia and Thailand, uh, retired from the Foreign Service, is now the president of Boeing for Southeast Asia. Um, and I have a Boeing story in the book, in fact, in, in that economic chapter. But um, on the, you know, that, see, that's with the, with the, with the Syria thing. That's where now we get into the, the DOD stuff, right? I mean, this is striking a, well, that's another whole story. But <laughs> the Secretary of State is the biggest proponent of the military action, but, you know, that, uh, but, Striking a, a, some a target in a foreign country is not diplomacy, right? So, first of all, I don't. We've been told about offers uh, from other countries to foot the bill or to help um, pay for those costs. I think nothing's been actually um, offered in terms of documentation. To, I haven't seen a formal proposal. The fact that um, a cabinet secretary will will discuss that on in a hearing on Capitol Hill. It's very telling to me. It's, they're not keeping it a secret. 
uh, the, those countries in, in the Middle East apparently are not keeping it a secret. So, um, uh, but I don't think it really has um, that much to do with diplomacy, to be honest. So I'll just I'll just uh, that, I mean, keep that, it at that. That's not the first time that we have done something like that. Uh, it seemed to me was it the was it the Kosovo or, or was well, that was the, a NATO campaign. The, but. Yeah, I mean that first, was the first Gulf War. That's yeah. it. Yeah, where where we did the receive we, we the made money. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So we then the the. the the link, it would be, if you want, with them would be, okay, so you said mercenaries, you know, are we doing this for them or are we doing this because we think it affects our security, right? That's really the, and that's the main yeah. dispute on the Hill, because many members of Congress don't believe it has to do with American national interest and national security, right? So that's really the, the key issue there. Uh, okay, I promised you, yes. Uh, Samar Chatterjee for the Safe Foundation. Um, just a quick comment uh, based on what you just said, and I have a question on that uh, statistics that you have presented. Um, uh, uh, that clientitis, or whatever that was mentioned, uh, I have looked at both uh, being a U.S. citizen, the U.S. Foreign Service, and having been born in India, I've looked at the Indian Foreign Service, and it seems the home offices, which means in case of the United States, the President and the Secretary of State, they don't want uh, uh, diplomats, and same is true in India, to get very too close and too cozy and friendly with, because otherwise you don't execute the orders that come, because that's what the diplomats are meant for. The question there is, if I look at the budget, you said the military budget is 12 times, and 13,000 members are 53 billion, and of course the military hires 1.4 million <laughs> members, so I think it's more cost effective to have a military than a foreign service, just kidding. It's, it's, it's a big, big gap. Well, so what, it's cheaper to have a, um, a soldier like than, a soldier is cheaper than a diplomat? It's, it's, a lot more jobs are being created and we have a high un unemployment at this time. Well, don't forget that the, you know, the actual number is two million because these people, the, the civil servants and the, you know, they also get paid from that budget. Um, so that but anyway, yeah. Right. Well, the you know the um, of course, th any government uh, official will will argue that it's actually much cheaper to fund to fund the diplomacy, because you then don't have to go to war, right? That's that's one of the main reasonings that you know if you put more money in diplomacy and you have a stronger foreign service, you won't get to a point where you have to fight. Uh, okay. Be, yes. <laughs> right. Yes. That's that, that's I said. That's the argument. That's the reasoning. Yes. Uh, the lady over here, yeah, and then we'll go to Nick. Thank you so much, and appreciate that. I've been reading your book over the past couple months. Um, uh, name is Ruth uh, Masters. Months? Candidate. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> Does it take that long? It. Pieces <laughs> of it, no. Uh, uh, Masters candidate at American University studying international affairs. Was just curious um, if you noticed any differences in the generations in terms of. Uh, baby boomers, millennials, Gen Xers who are a part of the Foreign Service and their expectations and their level of training, how they view their role as a Foreign Service officer? Well, uh, on, on this front, I'm actually optimistic because the people who've joined since 9-11 are very good. Even though they, you know, they aren't trained properly, I think, uh, or as much as they should be, there's something, I don't know, is it more enthusiasm? Is it more, I, I, it just seems they, they just know how to go and get things done more and more, quick, more quickly and more efficiently than some of the people who maybe joined in the 80s or even in the 90s. And um, it's, I think it, it made the difference when you joined because after 9-11, you know, people just were more dedicated or they have this desire in the 90s. It was just, you know, there was no money at all. They, they even froze hiring for um, a, a time. The, the, the rest of the decade was just hiring based just barely to attrition. Uh, and so just the morale was so low and it wasn't that exciting. The Cold War had ended and what, you know, wasn't clear what exactly they were supposed to be doing. And, and public diplomacy is a good example of, of that identity crisis that exactly. Um, so, and I still see, um, you know, the system is so weird that even though they're, you know, there are many, many fantastic people in the Foreign Service. Uh, and, and if you look at the top, I mean, you know, everybody will give you the example of Bill Burns, who's been in the Foreign Service since, since 82, and uh, in fact was on my show a few weeks ago. So, um, in that, but at the same time, the system has allowed too many people to, to keep going and get promoted and stay in the service for 20 and more years. And honestly, people like, how did this person 
how is they how are they still in after so many years? And, you know, everybody knows what he or she can or cannot do, and you know what a bad manager they are or whatever the you know the and but the system has somehow allowed for that to happen. And so the so my issue is not that there aren't good people in the foreign service, there are brilliant people in the foreign service, but the 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 issue is that it's not the institution that made them brilliant, right? They either came in with it, they had it in their DNA, whatever it is. Or they just were lucky enough to be at the right, the right place at the right time, or to have a, a good boss in their first or second tour to teach them the right things. But it's not. There's nothing systemic in the in, at the institution that is supposed to produce a, a brilliant diplomat. And so that and they they also they recognize that, and all the people that I've that I've talked to, including the the highest uh, uh, ranking officials, recognize that. It's just that you know there's always something. You know there's always a crisis. There's always a budget battle of some sort, and and unfortunately there is no time. Uh, to do things like that, but um, okay, I yeah, promised you. So one, yeah, this. Yes, I'm uh, Brian Marshall. I'm semi-retired right now, but at the same time, uh, I uh, formerly worked on a series of temporary one-year appointments for the State Department in what we call the 3161 Great. capacity, and uh, I've also worked with international agencies as well. And I had to mirror a little bit from what you said, almost no training prior to uh, uh, going to Iraq, where I served. I did four years uh, on a series of one-year appointments there. And uh, now I recall uh, we were, went through some training program at the Foreign Service Institute uh, prior to being sent over to Iraq. I was hired on the basis of my uh, OSCE, Organization for Security and Cooperation in, in Europe uh, work. Um, and, my, and I had the relevant uh, uh, background for the position. So uh, I had to demur a little bit from what you were saying. Well, was the, the training you got at FSI adequate, sufficient? Uh, no, I have to oh, acknowledge well, that it was not that. Uh, it was only a week. <laughs> yeah, it was only a week. Right. And honestly, sometimes uh, uh, FSOs don't even have time to do as much as you've done. I mean, you know, they, they actually extended it, I think, now it's a bit longer than it used to be, but when this the first year or two they started, the, the, the PRTs in particular, and um, people just dropped in and, and just, you know, and th th that's why uh, I have a, um, I wrote a piece in foreign policy a few months ago and it was it was titled Sink or Swim. It's literally, you drop there and it's you're being in the, in the, you're in the deep end. If you can swim or you'll learn on your, how to swim, then you, you know, fine, but if not, you just, and man, I mean, people have, people have uh, curtailed from those assignments, people have been reassigned, people just have done so poorly that they just have to be kicked out. You know, you're not really, you know, you've, uh, you're not officially kicked out. There's always a way to mask it when, you know, with some other word or something. But um, yeah, the, I, I actually have, I believe I have a quote on the record uh, in the book from a, a PRT leader um, who, who talked about a, an officer, he, he just said she was just terrible. And he, well, he talked the embassy, he was in a PRT out in um, Kirkuk, I think, and he talked the embassy into taking her mm -hmm. in Baghdad because he just didn't know what to do with her. So, and, but you know, there are good stories and bad stories, of course. It's not, it's not all gray and it's, that's, that's why um, there's such a diversity and, and variety of things that people do. And, um, but anyway, food for thought. That is a right? vast system, and there seems to be room for everyone in it. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, thank you so much for an absolutely compelling presentation. <laughs> I hope you have time to stick around outside and right, sell a yeah. few books and sign thanks, a few yeah, books. Thanks very much, yeah.